as you as you guys know, earlier this week, Renault came out with a plan for its future for what it will be doing in 2030 and in separating basically into five businesses, five buckets where they would find revenues. And, and one of them was uh, or is in the elegantly, I think, called horse. And I suppose that means horsepower. And this is a 50-50 joint venture with, with the company Gili. And basically, they're saying, okay, let's consolidate what we have in terms of producing internal combustion engines. So between the two of them, they'll have 17 production powertrain plants, five R&D centers, and 19,000 employees making use of what they have. Um, John, you've long been a proponent of consolidation in this space. Um, do, do you think that maybe um, Geely and, and Renault have hit on something that could be a model for other OEMs in the industry to uh, to undertake? That's how I see it. In fact, you know, it started with Volvo. Volvo spun off its uh, piston power operations to this joint venture with Geely. Now Geely has reached out. They got Renault in there. You know, I, to your point, Gary, I mean, I wrote this years ago that GM Ford and now Stellantis should offload their their uh, their powertrain operations, you know, everything with a piston and a transmission, consolidate that into one. And, you know, I'm not the first one to, to talk about this. Sergio Marchion, when he ran Fiat Chrysler, said, hey, look, every legacy automaker in the world builds a four-cylinder engine that they're almost all identical. And they make V6 engines that are almost identical and transmissions, six, seven, eight speeds. They're almost all identical. And you know what? The customer doesn't even know what kind of transmission, you know, it's manual or automatic. That's all they know. Most of them don't even know what kind of engines under the hood. So if they don't care, consolidate it all. And now you can save a bunch of money because you know, this entity, this new entity that makes only piston engines and transmissions, is going to have far greater economies of scale than any of those individual companies would have. In fact, I, I think it's entirely possible, we'll pick on GM for a minute, if GM, Ford, and Chrysler did this and, and consolidated everything, I dare say they could buy engines cheaper than they can make them themselves. And as more and more EVs get sold, and they will, and as the production volume of ICE vehicles goes down, I mean, what are you going to do? You're, it's going down. It's going to drive up your costs as you lose economies of scale. It makes all the sense of, in the world to me to start consolidating these operations. And, and bravo to Geely for getting Renault and uh, Volvo to join the effort. All right, Jack. So, so you're, you're an enthusiast when it comes to automobiles. So it, it, it sounds to me that, that John is borderline heretical here when he's saying that that companies across the board can use the same engine. I mean, well, yes and no. I mean, General Motors did that, right? I mean, remember when General Motors' individual divisions built their engineered their own engines? In fact, you Jack, know, remember? Yeah, re remember I'm, I'm when old, remember that. Yeah. Oldsmobile got sued because they put a Chevy engine in their exactly. car. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, in the old days, and I remember the old days quite well. Uh, you know, that was a big differentiator. Is it going to be a differentiator going forward? I don't know, because to exactly John's point, uh, you know, I look at the specs of the, the typical four cylinder, two, uh, two liter engine, you know, for, uh, and they're virtually the same. Right. <laughs> so all so of the manufacturers. Right. I, so I, I, I did caveat what I had said. So there are people who are there into their Hemi, you know, the, the Ford Coyote engine, the LS, you know, all the LSs at GM. Those people care about the power plant that's under their hood, but they don't even comprise 10% of the new car buying public. So in, in my argument, automakers would keep those special engines, keep them as they always were. But for the 90% of the public that doesn't care or know, consolidate it all. All right. But but OK, so so you've used the example of of let's call them specialist engines, the, the engines that go into the performance vehicles. But let's take, for example, Ford EcoBoost. I mean, it, it seems to me they they did a tremendous successfully executed plan by having something that was called EcoBoost that would be different from what you could get from Chevy or what you could get from Chrysler. I mean, that would conceivably go away because, I mean, that's a mass market engine. 
or you know, family vengeance. I think that you know branding of, of something like Echo Boost or Eco Boost. I don't know how to say it. I mean, you know, maybe I say it either way. In, in uh, America, it's Eco Boost, yeah, and then it's uh, Echo Sport. If yeah. you're talking about the vehicle, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, but uh, you know, uh, getting beyond the facetiousness here. I mean, uh, I think you can brand on power plants still, but I, I wonder uh, with electric vehicles, does anybody know who makes the motors? Uh, you know that, and does anybody care? Does it really matter at all? Uh, you know, what kind of electric motor, where that motor is made? Is it made proprietary by the manufacturer? Or are they buying motors from a supplier somewhere? And I would think to this to the same point and to John's point, you know, if you get an an internal combustion engine from a supplier and it does the job, um, that's just fine. That's a great point, Jack. You, you, you're absolutely right. People can't tell the difference in electric motor. You you and Gary and I are uh, of a, an era when I remember I could tell what engine was starting up just from the sound the starter motor made. <laughs> And, yeah. and you can identify cars, you know, coming down the street by the sound of their exhaust note. And uh, so, you know, but that that that's an era that's long gone. You know, Gary, to your point about the, the V6 EcoBoost, I remember uh, Tom Stevens, when he ran GM Powertrain, explaining to me, he said, look, John, uh, an, a powertrain is a box. The box is this size. It's this tall, this wide, this deep. And it fits into this space and it generates this amount of power and it consumes this amount of fuel. So he says, when the different divisions come to me and ask for a powertrain in their new vehicle, I always ask them, what kind of a box do they want? And I think that's where we're at in this discussion. It's just a box. All right. So, so I, I think to the consumer, though, it probably makes a difference. And, you know, if I'm buying a Mercedes Benz versus I'm buying a Kia, I don't want to believe that my Mercedes Benz has the same engine that is powering that Kia. And, you know, I'm not throwing aspersions at Kia, but, right. you know, you're buying premium, right? When you're buying a premium product. Right. So you would think that there would be some differentiation, right? As opposed to it's, it's yeah. all of the same. So, and, and so you're answering, you know, uh, the point that I'm making in, in the sense that what I'm talking about this consolidation is for the 90% who don't care. Okay. But, but we're, we're, so, so since we're in the way back machine here, remember when there was the consolidation of Mitsubishi, Hyundai and Chrysler, and they all got together and they were going to make a world engine that would be used in all these applications. And, um, they built the factory in Dundee, Michigan, which, uh, now is probably famous for being close to a giant Cabela's and no one remembers that engine anymore. I mean, it, it's been tried. It didn't work. Well, it, it, it there was, uh, it didn't work because uh, first Mitsubishi pulled out, they, they, they changed their minds and then Hyundai changed its mind. And then Fiat Chrysler at that point, I guess it was decided, Hey, we can fill up the plant with the volume that we need anyway. So that went nowhere. But we've seen uh, attempts at working together on engines. You know, BMW and Chrysler famously had a design contest to see which engine would go in the Mini. Chrysler actually won that contest, and they started building the engine in Brazil because they needed export credits and things like that. And we've seen GM and Ford collaborate on transmissions, but no one was ever serious about it. And, and the big problem that you run into is when you do a collaborative effort you know, company A says, well, we'll use our design. And company B says, no, no, our design is better. And they end up with this mishmash of a compromise that never works. And that's why in my argument, if you're going to offload the stuff, do it like Geely did. Offload it completely. It's no longer a collaboration. You're turning all of your engine development over to a standalone company. Let it make the proper decisions as to what's best.